Hamilton and a professor at the Vet Tech program at Jolie Junior College. Uh, we've been at, our program is now 11 years old. We've been accredited for 10 years now. Um, and this is Tracy Dole. Tracy graduated last year and just finished up her year uh, uh, working at North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine, where she was a equine as horse uh, intensive, care. intensive care on a night shift and uh, did a lot of sick horse stuff. Uh, today we're going to be talking about parasites. Um, I gave this the spiel a couple years ago at JJC. Um, it, we're not going to do the lab. We're going to show you how to do stuff so you can take this, this, this information and take it back to your students. And you can have them run school samples and all that stuff. We'll tell you about the ins and outs of what you can do in the lab and what you got to look out, look out for. Zoonotic problems uh, and health problems. Um, but anyway, my job today, I feel my job today because I teach this stuff for the last 10 years. I teach clinical pathology and large animal medicine and uh, anatomy. And my job in clinical pathology is to do parasitology and hematology. And I know that if you understand the basic life cycle of endoparasites and heteroparasites, they're just basic life cycles. If you understand those two things, you can figure out the life cycle of any parasite. External or internal parasite. So I'll stress this stuff to you today and we'll go through it. It's not that difficult. There's a couple big words here, but the handouts that you have, I made this thing up three years ago and I gave it to my students at Vet Tech and they said there were better than the handouts that I gave. Them. These are great handouts. They're good pictures, they're very plain. Well, you want them? Sure. Anybody else in the handout? The handout also starts out with the basic microscopy. That's where a lot of us spoof up. We all know how to use a microscope, but we don't. I spent four hours in my very first class in, uh, in clinical pathology talking about the microscope. We're not going to go through that. This, this is not going to be long enough. But you got to understand the microscope. So when we go, we got some slides here for external parasite slides under now that we can take uh, when we get a little break. We'll, um, look at them and then we'll change the slides for you to look at internal parasites. So anyway, let's start out. This is parasitology and uh, we classify our parasites as endoparasites. They're the worm. And we've got ectoparasites, those are the bugs. Okay? Um, on the, on the endo, uh, endoparasites, the worms, there's four basic families of endoparasites that we deal with. Uh, and you're going to see these a lot. Some of these more than others. The nematodes. The nematodes are the round worms, the hook worms, the pin worms, the uh, whip worms, uh, the strong giles and horses. The reason why we call them, the nematodes are all called round worms. And the reason why is the fact that if you take a worm and cut them in half and look at the cross section, they're round. That's why we classify them as round worms. But not all endo endoparasites are roundworms, but all roundworms are nematodes. Okay? Heartworms fall in this category too. Then we've got cestodes, those are the tapeworms. A little bit more complex life cycle than the nematodes, and we'll just touch on it today. We also have the trematodes, those are the flukes. We don't have a lot of fluke problem in Illinois, but if you've got farm ponds, snails, and animals that do a lot of grazing around the farm ponds, you can get liver flukes. And I had a sheep farmer out in Ottawa, Illinois, who had a ton of flukes. Uh, and protozoa, those are the coccidia. Anybody here know about Neosporum caninum? Have you heard about this? It's a big thing that causes abortions in dairy cattle and beef cattle. They've got a vaccine for it. And, and coccidiosis is that thing that puppies get and they die and get diarrhea. Puppies, kitties, pigs, sheep, goats. And then we got the ectoparasites. Oh, first of all, if you've got an animal that's got endoparasites, we call that an infection. If you have an animal that you see with external parasites, we call that an infestation. So that two terms you should know, infection and in infestation. 
because you can't get an infection of fleas, and you can't get an infestation of hooks, hookworms, okay? Infection or infestation. Now, the bugs. The bugs are all, the bugs that we care about in livestock, domestic animals, are arthropods. Arthro means joint, podia means leg, so joint to legs. And they include the dipterans, we call them flies. They include lice, fleas, ticks, and mites. And we also subdivide these classes of ectoparasites and how many legs they got. Remember that from way long time ago? Insects got six legs, three body sections, head, thorax, and abdomen. In your notes, we got all that for you. Divide it up. And then we got arachnids, spiders, scorpions, ticks, mites. So if they got six legs, they're an insect. Okay? And that includes the flies, the lice, and the fleas. Okay? And of course, the flies, my students, hate this part of parasitology. For some reason, they just hate to study flies. They say they all look the same. What do you all look the same? Well, they all feed the same. Well, they don't all feed the same. Well, they all lay their eggs in manure. No, they don't lay eggs in manure at all. But you remember all the flies? You got the face fly, horn fly, horse fly, house fly, stable fly, grub fly, mosquito. Mosquitoes in the dipterin area. Dipterin simply means two wings. It's all means two wings. So, let's go through a very basic life cycle of the ecotone. Like I told you, if you know this basic life cycle, you got a handle on this. This is not that difficult, but if you just review it a couple times, you can tell your students, they can come in with, you know, ask me any question about internal parasites, and you pretty well got the life cycle. What happens is, we'll talk about nematodes. Remember the nematodes? We're not talking about tapeworms and all the other stuff. Most nematodes have what we call a direct life cycle. In other words, it goes from cow to cow to cow to cow to cow. Or from dog to dog to dog. Or sheep to sheep to sheep. Uh, some nematodes have intermediate hosts. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But all tapeworms and, and flukes always have an intermediate host. They don't go from sheep to sheep. It goes from sheep to snail to sheep. Something like that. Not a big deal. OK, so what happens is, We've got nematodes in the gut of the animal. We'll just call it a cow. Okay? So you've got Ostratasia or uh, Nematiris, one of the fluke worms, or one of the uh, gut worms. Okay? What happens inside the intestinal tract, males and females mate. I don't know if you know that or not, but that's how it really works. You know, <laughs> females get eggs. Sometimes they've got to review this or something. <laughs> so males and females get together, you know, they feast on some hay and stuff like that, and then they mate, okay? Uh, and then the female produces eggs. The eggs are inside the animal now. Remember the female is going to produce eggs that are inside the animal. And these eggs are then going to follow the formation of the manure, the feces. So they're going to be inside the feces, inside the animal. And then they're pooped out. Now you've got eggs inside the manure, outside the animal. Okay? Everybody knows you've got a big cow patty and it's got eggs in there. Okay? In most of the internal parasites, the nematodes, the roundworm type people, roundworm eggs, in most of them, the eggs are the manure. And then what's going to happen is the larvae is going to form inside of here, a little tiny baby worm. And it may take only 12 hours, sometimes only 8 hours. And this larvae punches a hole in the worm egg and comes out. Okay? That's a larval form. And then what happens is, because this is the first stage, because most of the larval form will be in three stages. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to try to, it's too complicated, but the larva form goes through L1, L2, L3. And take my word for it, these kids in my class, they go through this all the time. L1, L2, L3. L3 is always the infected. So it goes through a little life cycle inside the manure, usually. And these larval form will generally eat the bugs inside the manure. 
Okay, and they molt and they go through third. Now they get to third stage larva. Then they do is the third stage larva migrate up the grass. We're talking about livestock type, okay? They migrate up the grass. And they sit on top of the grass, cow comes along, eats the grass, and it gets the effective larval stage in. Okay? And then that will turn into an adult inside the animal. Somewhere. It turns into an adult. Okay? So that is a very basic life cycle of an animal. Now, it can be very interesting of all the different variations. And these were, when you're a vet student or a vet tech student, you have to know all the different life cycles. And it can get very complicated. What makes this unique about parasites is that the internal parasites and external parasites have been around since dinosaur time. And guess what? They've been around since dinosaur time, and we still can't kill them. Think about it. We're still trying to kill them. How does this happen? Because these damn things have evolved. It's amazing. They have evolved through meteor strikes, uh, large, uh, Volcanoes, floods, ice, uh, nuclear attack. They, they survived all this and are still here. What's totally amazing is that they have done this over evolution. That's why they've got some of them got really complex life cycles. Because they know if they go through, they used to go through A to B to C to D. Now they go from A to B up down to Q, R, S, come back up. Because they know if they went to that same part of that life cycle, they'd be killed off. A good example is ivermectin. Anybody here use ivermectin on horses or cattle or dogs and cats? If you go south of Missouri right now and you own sheep, 100% of the sheep in, in the southern part of the United States are resistant to ivermectin, the internal parasites. It won't work. They then they're going to come back as well. They're going to variations of it now. These things have evolved. And how long has ivermectin been around? 20 years. So it took the worms 20 years, only 20 years, and now they're completely resistant to ivermectin. Remember when it first came out? Oh my gosh, it was the panacea. It would kill anything. People wash their cars in it. I mean, it was really amazing how the thing was, you know, everybody just loved ivermectin. Now it's worth squat, I mean, so if you're a sheep. It's because, you know, we dewormed a lot of sheep. They're on some, Confined area. These things going through life cycles like crazy. This whole life cycle here normally, like in a hookworm and a dog, takes 18 days. That's it. Some of these things go through in about a month in cattle. Usually 30 days takes for the whole life cycle to complete. Another thing too is it's pretty neat. Now remember I told you that this L3 form goes up on the grass? Now, if you're a little worm, and you're growing up on a dry blade of grass, it'd be pretty tough on you, wouldn't it? But what if you had some water there? You lubricated that, that grass with water. Now, how do you get water on a blade of grass? Do. So you know yourself, you and livestock. It used to be, you remember your dad used to tell you this, or your grandpa, or the, or the uh, extension guy. You usually don't put your cattle out in the grass and just do it. Wait till the dew burns off. It's because these larvae form will crawl up to the top when it's dewy, and then when things start to dry out, they crawl down. So there's less of a chance for your cow to get infected. What's well, another really neat thing about this too is uh, it's so cool. That, I get excited about this. I teach this stuff, okay? And I get a little excited about this because you've got you have to understand that how let me, let me ask you this question. This is what's amazing. You got this L3 larval form, and it's inside a cow. Say it's Ostratasia. Ostratasia, Ostratasia, which is a genus species of a very common uh, apomasal intestinal worm uh, of cattle, beef and dairy, and sheep and goats, ruminants. Like. Okay, the L3 form is inside the gut. And it wants to change into an L4 form. I want to change into an adult and find a male or female, mate, and lay eggs. But as it's crawling through, when it's ready to turn into an adult, it says to itself, hey, you know what? 
It's 20 degrees below zero outside. And if I lay my eggs in the manure, and that cow poops it out, I'm going to freeze on contact. All my eggs will be dead. Now, how the hell does that larva know it's cold outside? I don't know. We've been studying this phenomenon for years. We can't figure out how this works. But that larva knows it's cold outside. So, we, uh, they, what they do is they go through hypobiosis. They hibernate inside the wall of an omasum or an omasum or even a ruin or even a sequel. They'll hibernate in the wall. It's called hypobiosis. Now, that's a problem here um, uh, in the wintertime. But if you go down south, the problem is when it's really hot and dry. Now they go through hypobiosis during the summer, during the southern, uh, southern part of the United States. Then that kind of stuff works. Okay, uh, quickly we'll go through heartworms. Uh, you always have this, everybody knows about heartworms, right? You got the kids that are hot dog on heartworm, heartworms. You got you guys use heartworms medicine on your dogs. The cats are trying to push that. There's no cure for the cat. Uh, they tried to test it, but there's no use on it. But anyway, heartworms got a pretty unique cycle. It's pretty neat stuff how this works. Remember, we call this the basic. Remember this? Adults mate, the eggs are in the change into larvae, they're ingested, and that's the whole life cycle of 99.9% .9 of the hematoma. That's it. So now you know that. Why don't my students understand this? They don't understand. They just don't get it. Not till the fourth time. <laughs> yeah, fourth time. Usually after about three exams, they miss the same question 55 times, and then they find, oh, I finally figured this out. Yeah, L3 is the question. How many times have I told you that? Every day. Yeah. <laughs> Hardware. This is a pretty unique life cycle. I, I just, this cycle here is just something. I mean, this thing is been around for gazillion years. I think dinosaurs might have had this stuff. Who knows? Anyway, you got adults and live inside the heart. Okay? And I begin. You got males and females. They mate. Oh, I can tell you this. You know when I said males and females mate up there? On, on some strontoloides, she gets a kick out of this because it's cool. Strontoloides is a special type of it's a round worm. Um, Strongyloides is usually in, uh, you find them in young cattle, uh, foals, and dogs and cats. And uh, what Strongyloides does is when the adults are in the intestinal tract, if there's not enough females, I mean, if there's not enough males, the females self fertilize. But if you got all males, and there's not enough females, the males all die. <laughs> so the females survive, the males, they don't they just give up. But that's pretty cool. So the, the sorbiloides is that the females will definitely lay eggs. We don't need the guys. It's ain't right enough yet. We don't need them. And usually makes, I get a round of applause from all my students because most of them are girls. <laughs> okay, heartworms. You got males and females that made it inside the heart. And then the females don't produce eggs. They produce, like a larval form, except this is called microfilaria. This larval form is not infected. These float through the dog's bloodstream by the millions. Okay? Then you can see it's an indirect life cycle because now the mosquito comes down and sucks blood from the dog with that little sucker thing that comes out of its mouth. Okay? Oh, yes. I don't know what do you call it. What's that called? Oh, wow. So anyway, the mosquito sucks the blood from the dog. Okay? Now, inside the mosquito, you get this. L1, L2, L3. Inside the mosquito. It won't happen inside the dog. But it happens inside the mosquito. Now the mosquito comes by, and this is pretty really cool. The mosquito comes by to another dog. Okay? And you know it's going to stick that do wrapper thing inside your skin. It's going to suck blood. Well, it's sucking the blood, it's making saliva. It's like spitting. And the saliva runs down this little 
two to wagger, and it runs down the bottom of it, and L3 forms that's inside the mosquito now puddle on top of the skin. So when the mosquito pulls out that proboscis thing, the L3s fall into the hole. Isn't that cool? That's really neat. So they're under the skin. Then they change to L4, and they go to muscles and cartilage and da 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 all this good stuff. Okay? You guys, they got to remember those. It's not that far. But anyway, then they finally find their way back to the heart. This whole life cycle takes six months. Okay? So, if you have a dog that's four months old, you do a heart rhythm test, a little puppy, it ain't going to come out positive. You're not going to see my flurry or anything. You're not. Okay? Okay. So that's that. Now, ectoparasites. The basic life cycle. You guys all know it. We'll take a fly. The fly lays an egg. The egg hatches into a maggot, which is larval forms. We don't call them larval, we call them instar. They're no big deal. But they're called maggots. You see maggots, right? They're all from flies. There's no maggots from ticks or mice. There's maggots from flies. That's the larval form. And after this guy goes through three stages of instar stages, it forms a cocoon. Just like a caterpillar makes a cocoon. Okay? Then the cocoon hatches and makes a small little print and it looks like a small adult. You can even forget the name from the say adult. That's how a flea does it. A larva pupa adult. This is called larva pupa, but magnet cocoon. And fleas do the same thing. Okay? Fleas can stay in a cocoon stage for up to two to three years. So some people buy some people, you might want to try to sell a house and they had dogs and cats. Dogs and cats had fleas. The fleas jump off the dog. And the larval form of a flea is an ugly critter. Oh, it's an ugly. It's all hairy, little tiny worms, it's all hairy, it's got a big claw on it. And when it does, it goes into a carpet, it eats anything organic. Um, skin off your hair, off your arm, hair, um, uh, these called these little dust bugs. They eat anything organic. Even eat other, they eat flea poo. And then they get all filled up and they spin a cocoon. And then the cocoon can go there for two years. So if you move into a house, and the house has been vacant for two years, you can move into a house. And what really kicks these cocoons to hatch is the four major five. Four major five. So you've got to have an increase in heat, an increase in light, an increase in vibration, and increase in carbon dioxide. And think about this, if you move into your house in the middle of wintertime, you move into a brand new house, but I mean it's been old by somebody else, and it's been vacant for two years, you move in and guess what, you got movers. <laughs> CO2 builds up. What do you do? You turn the lights on, right? You turn the heat up, and you stomp around. These cocoons says, dinner time, and they all hatch at the same time and eat your face off. I mean, they're <laughs> They are absolutely starved. <laughs> They'll just bite you all over the place, okay? And I remember a Hollywood actress that up one and then she had to move out and they had to get the, they had to get the place, uh, what do you call it? Fumigated. Fumigated. Okay, so there's the basic life cycle of the external parasites. So now you got internal parasites, external parasites. Are there any questions? I mean, Let's talk about zoonosis. Zoonosis is a disease transmitted between animals and people, animals and man. We've got some nasties out there that deal with parasites. One of the worst ones that ever was and ever will be is the raccoon roundworm called Baileyasperus. The thing is with Baileyasperus, it goes through that same life cycle. The larvae are, larvae are in the species. They're in the feces. But usually with pure roundworms, the larvae doesn't really start to hatch until the animal, uh, another person swallows it, or, or, uh, or uh, another raccoon swallows it. But anyway, be, be that as it may. When it gets into an aberrant house, in other words, it's not a little raccoon, see a little kid. And these, this is deadly. The little kid's playing outside, and he gets 
some of the raccoon poop on his hands. You know what kids do, they always put their hands in the mouth, fingers in the mouth. And they get one of these baby asterisks, uh, larval forms inside the body. Since it's an aberrant host, the larvae don't know where to go. They have no idea. Generally, on roundworms, they go through the liver, lungs, up into the pharynx, and they're swallowed. That's how they do it. Okay? But this one doesn't know where to go because it's not a raccoon. So it goes into the eye. It goes into the brain. It goes into the liver. It goes into the nervous system. Those are called visceral larval migraines, neural larval migraines, ocular larval migraines, uh, nephrolarval larval migraines. Migraines. They're migrating all over the body, and this will kill people. There's been kids that are killed with brains. Their brains are eating alive. So it's pretty nasty. You can also get hookworms. Dog hookworms. I remember the University of Illinois. Everybody been on campus in UI, there's a quad in there, okay? And now all the students go out there, right? When I was in test school, it was really deep. Because I never went to the quad. I was always busy studying. But you know, somehow these kids found time to play, you know, frisbee, and they used to let the dogs run. So the dogs would be running like crazy, and the kids playing frisbee, and everybody's in bare feet. Oh, that was a long, I was in school a long time. But uh, they'd run through bare feet. So all of a sudden, these kids start by the hundreds who go into uh, what was it called the Kennedy Center, that's the medical center, and these kids would come in and their legs were totally red and almost like measles. It's called quick eruptions, and what it is is that the hookworm larvae are migrating through the feet of these kids and up the legs. And so they, they said, okay, universal in its in its infinite wisdom. It says they're going to cure it. They said you have to have your dog on a leash. <laughs> now you've got 10,000 kids with leashes that are 50 miles long, and they stake them into the ground. Now you've got 85,000 dogs running around, and they're all on leashes, and you don't think they poop? You already don't think these dogs poop? So these dogs are pooping out hundreds and thousands of hookworm eggs, and the kids are still getting infected. Duh! But that's your life. <laughs> they didn't even think about calling the vet school, and we could have told them, hey, you know? Don't let the dogs out. Pick up the poop. That'll work. Not in the Oh, yeah, zoonosis. We're still talking about zoonosis. Uh, oh, toxoplasmosis. Oh, toxoplasmosis. Anybody hear of toxoplasmosis? Um, toxoplasmosis is the. Uh, the definitive host, or the host that toxoplasmosis lives in, is the cat. But it goes everywhere. Pigs get it, uh, cattle get it. But it always, but it goes through the body of these aberrant hosts and it just dies off. But humans, when they come across this toxoplasmosis, what happens is, is mainly in pregnant women, and what happens is you ingest this or inhale it as a woman, and you're pregnant, what it does is that this larval form will go to the baby, and usually goes to the ocular centers, and it's usually the first trimester, so what happens is you get sight box. You get one eye, uh, and this has been a, and this is very, very, this is not common. This is not common. But it's, uh, it's actually very common that you have a titer. They say that people, especially around livestock, us guys been around livestock, you girls been around livestock, you probably have a horrible, big type of toxoplasmosis because you've been around pig dust, cattle dust, and these, these parasites are floating, you know, they're one cell, and you inhale the stuff and you get it in your mouth. But it usually doesn't affect you. But if you are pregnant and you have a cat, let your husband clean the liver, or your boyfriend, or your significant other. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, you've all heard about pinworms, right? Oh boy, you heard about pinworms. My kids got pinworms. Where do the kids get pinworms? From other kids. Pinworms in humans. What works is, well, how it works is the pinworm is around, it's a nematode. And the worm itself, and you can almost identical do the same life cycle with a horse pinworm because the horses are the only domestic animal that have pinworms and they're completely non zoonotic You cannot get pinworms from animals. No matter what your pediatrician says, it ain't no way. 
Your kid's got kitten worms? It's good. Your kid's got pinworms? It's because he got them from some other kid. What happens is the pinworm worm comes out of the anus. And it wants to crawl out of the anus and hook its egg onto the, on, and around the anal area of the human. Same thing happens in horses. And this is a cement. Okay? The kid says, wow, that itches and scratches his butt. Knocks off the eggs onto the sheet. Okay? Or on the bed. And if you see another kid, the kid's going to be rolling over. He gets his stuff. He ingests it. Now that's how that kid gets kind of, That's how it works. You can't get it by immaculate conception and stuff. It doesn't happen from the air. The kids give it to kids. Okay? So, you know I remember a pediatrician that was in our town. And this lady came, I remember this. So, this lady came, and she was my son. She had two kids. And she bought a puppy. We did stool samples, three stool samples on this puppy. You know, we did them at four weeks, eight weeks, 12, 16 weeks. And it was negative. We go old enough to know parasites. One day I get a call from her and she's ticked off as hell. She's pissed. She's not ticked. She's pissed. And, I, and she, uh, she said, what? She goes, my, kid, my kid's got payworms. And the pediatrician said he got them from the puppy. And I said, ain't no way. She goes, he said there was. And you didn't do a good job doing the fecal sample. And I said, your puppy does, did not get pinworms. I mean, your kids didn't get pinworms in the puppy. Oh, yes, it did, my pediatrician. So I called it. I didn't call it pediatrician. I wrote to the professor of parasitology at University of Illinois, gave this physician's name and number and address, and had him write a letter. He sent them a thesis of pinworms, you know? So you can't get pinworms in animals. So you might hear this, but it ain't going to happen. Only horses get pinworms. And you can tell the horses get pinworms because they can't scratch their butt. So what they do is take their tail, they rub their butt against the stall wall, and what happens, you get rat tail. The hair comes off, and you got nice uh, hair on the tail, and then all of a sudden you get a spot that looks like uh, a brush. It's called rat tail. And there's no hair. That's because they've been rubbing. Because they're rubbing because of buggers. Uh, itches. Uh, we're going to show you real quick how to do the stool samples. You can do this in your, in your, uh, with the kids in laboratory. It doesn't take much. Uh, I always, I bought this thing. I bought this thing from uh, a restaurant supply plant. You know, this is, for, what is it, for salads or whatever it is. Vegetable tray. Yeah, I bought six or seven of these. What's it called? A veggie tray. A veggie tray. <laughs> and I bought this, and she goes, how do you need six or seven? I said, I, I need this for school. And she goes, what are you going to have in school? I said, well, I use school samples. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't put the two and two together because it, this is, but what you do with this is you'll see that this stuff can get messy and you put the fecal flotations in here and you got numbers on them. And I got 18, well, I got 12 kids in the, you know, each lab. So they can put their own little samples in here and they, I don't care if they spill on anything, they'll just take it and wash off. This goes to uh, if you're doing if you're doing horses or cattle on uh, stool samples, you know that uh, you get a. I tell farmers I used to, when I was in practice, I told farmers I need a stool sample from your herd. Do a do a general pick a little bit up from you know if it's a dairy, pick some up from the freshening stall, pick some up from the dry cow stall, pick some up from the you know the milking herd and the calves, and, and bring it easy brings in three three six pound coffee cans full of this stuff. I only need a coffee cup full at the most. They always bring this stuff in my sack. Uh, you, you need about a half a teaspoon of fecal sample to run this. Uh, uh, Tracy is going to go ahead and show you how to do all this stuff. One thing you should always understand is if you do this with kids and you do a, uh, you do a lab like this and they come back in two days and they're sick, they're going to blame you. So take some precautions. Use gloves. Have an open window so the smell can get out. And have water so they can wash their hands. Okay? And if you have to, you can get these dust masks that you can buy in the store because the kids are going to, you know, goof around and it's going to splash up in their face. And if there's worms in there, they could, you know, if there's parasites in there, they could get it. So just make sure that the kids don't mess with it. When they mess with it, just make sure they're protected. I don't do this in my life. Thank <laughs> you.
My kids know they're in there, they sign a waiver on day one. They, they, if they get something from the labs too bad. I remember last year we had five kids come down with crypto. 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 You know, crypto is crypto. Oh, we have, they have it everywhere. Crypto is bad. But we got to, you know, dairy cows carry it. And of course, when I take the kids out, we have a bunch of replacement heifer pens, and they're all tame. And so what happens is the kids come in and they lick the kind of heifers with them, and they love it. You know, taking pictures. Well, you know, what happens is they get the saliva, and they get the feces that are in the cow's muzzle, and they get crypto. Sorry, you signed the waiver. So she's going to tell you how to do a fecal flotation. Okay. So as you can see up here, we have so I'm just going to kind of briefly go through it with y'all. Um, so basically, when you're doing a fecal flotation, you're using a solution that has a different specific gravity than the eggs to get them to race to the top. There's several different containers or canisters that you can use. You would put your sample right here in the bottom. You can use, you know, pill vial. Um, different veterinary supply companies, you know, sell different little poop containers. This is my favorite because if I send, you know, a client out to get a poop sample from their dog or cat, they can just kind of plug it and put it in and they're done. There's no mess. Oh, okay. oh, this one. This one. Oh, oh yeah, that's the one. You know, if you have Mrs. Smith comes in and you, and you tell her, I need a school sample from your pup. What's that? Uh, some, some feces, some poop. Oh, okay. She says, well, I, how, where do I go? Oh, you got to go home and pick some out. What? <laughs> what? And then, you know, then you say, well, then you got to bring it in. If you can't bring it in right away, put it in the refrigerator. She goes, what? <laughs> no, she just said, figure this out. I'm using Mrs. Smith because the old man never brings a puppy in, right? He's <laughs> always the household. He's so, but I produce that. That's right. <laughs> so here you got, this just shows you how if you want, if you want, your compliance. compliance. If you want client compliance, make it easy. Here, this one here, this one here, this little fecalizer thing, sold for a year. Now here we got the housewife. It's seven o'clock in the morning, and she's got to get the kids to school, and she and she's got to uh, get herself to work. And of course, she got to kiss her husband goodbye and all that stuff. Be nice. Uh, and it's raining outside, and she's in a roll. And she's got the puppy on the lead. It's pouring down, right? She's got an umbrella, and she's got to get a stool sample from the veterinarian. So she says, "Well, how do you know?" She's spiking. She's got. A, she's only got two hands. She's got one puppy. She's trying to keep her road closed. She's holding on to the umbrella. And then, as a veterinarian, you give her this. Thing. Now look. This is. See this thing? That's a shovel. <laughs> and you're supposed to go out there, and you're supposed to have this lady. That is pouring down rain, and you're supposed to go out. She's supposed to pick up this with this little tiny thing. And she, she's gonna say, "To hell with it! I ain't gonna do this, you know." She's gonna throw this stuff away. <laughs> so that's why you use this one. It's expensive, but but see this one here. All she's got to do is go like that, and it sticks to the bottom. She sticks it in here, puts this down here, and now it's sweet looking. See it? If you make it tough on the client, then you're never gonna race. We'll see. It. This one's similar to that one. Oh, it's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> this one here has a little tiny white shovel. You can't see it, but it's got a little tiny white shovel. And you're supposed to put the stool sample inside this hole. And then it gives you a little. Yeah, here's the shovel. Yeah, here's, there's the shovel. <laughs> and you got this lady out there trying to do something in a rainstorm or in a cold. And she's got to get this the stool is steaming in this winter side. And you got to get her in, and you got to put the lid on it. And of course, the lid never fits. I'm telling you, I never got one of these in the 50s. They always go silent. And then this is worse to be worse because now you got to put a little chimney on when you get to the office and you got to find a way to get a stool sample in there. And oh, it's just a mess. This one, that other one's a mess. Okay, Tracy, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, along with our little um, sample and our flotation solution, um, which, real quick, there is. In your handout, there is a recipe to make cheaper solution. It is the most well-known and most used type of paper flotation solution in the world. It's very easy, so anybody can make it. Um, so you've got your solution, and then we've got our um, cover slips for microscope slides, and then we have your microscope slides. 
Now, if you're doing large animal, um, you're going to want to make it up your solution and stir your poop and then strain it into another container because um, obviously you're going to have grass and hay and all kinds of stuff. So just keep that in mind. If you're doing large animal, you might want to have another strainer. Um, if, you're just, if you're doing a small animal, um, you basically take your sample of a small animal. These are my pickle jars. Over the last eight years, Every time I get a large animal or a small animal positive stool sample, I put a little bit in these jars with formaldehyde in it. See, some of these things are eight and ten years old, this stool sample. And but they got one. Yeah, one year we actually saw a light one. Oh yeah. We had one in class. Yeah, in the class. We had a small animal. We had a roundworm eight. And it's been in formaldehyde for two years. I mean, because we didn't use it in one year. We had it had been there two years. We took it, floated it, put it on the slide, and you can see the larvae starting to move. It's been in formaldehyde. That's how tough these worm are. Okay, so we have our sample, and you only need about a teaspoon. I mean, you need a small amount because there's plenty of eggs in there. Trust me. So go ahead and put your sample in. You want to kind of squish it around a little bit. And then you're going to take your flotation solution, whether it's the sheeters or there are some other um, solutions that you can buy. And you're going to fill your cup. I usually like to do it about three quarters of the way, because then what I do is I'll stir it up a little more, get it nice and fluid in there. And then I'm going to fill it all the way to the top, but I'm going to make a positive meniscus. I'm going to actually fill it up higher than the line of the cup so that when I put my cover slip on top, the eggs are going to make contact with it. Because what happens is, is after it sits for a few minutes, the eggs start to float to the top because the specific gravity is different. And then they'll attach to your slip cover. So, positive meniscus. You can see like that. And, and the positive meniscus means it's sitting over the top like this. And you can do it because the specific gravity of the solution is like 1.14. And you don't remember water is 1.0. So if you have just plain water, you have a negative meniscus. But if you have something that's got greater specific gravity, you have a positive meniscus. And that's when the worm eggs come up, you're going to float and hit on the bottom of the cover. So you usually want to let it sit for about 10 minutes. And then you can go ahead and put your slip cover on your slide and identify the eggs um, on the microscope. And that's what we're looking for. You never never going to see any larval forms or any adult forms. You're only going to see the eggs. That's the point that you must know. Remember on the life cycle, you're not going to see the larval forms because they're going to be in the stool, but they're going to be microscopic, and you're not going to see them. Okay? And if you did see them, you wouldn't know what the hell it was because only a veterinary parasitologist would know it's a hook on larvae or on an larvae, it's going to die larvae. But you're going to look for the eggs in the stool. Okay? You don't see any adult worms, ever in stools, except maybe an occasional tapeworm uh, segment that busted off, okay? But you're not going to see adults. You're not. So remember, you know, you can go through the stool and say, oh, there's no worms in here. Okay. Sometimes you'll see a big old round worm in there. It'll look like a piece of spaghetti inside the stool. Yeah, there it is dead. Yeah, there is a dead, but that means that the puppy's got a ton of round worms inside his gut because that thing died and came out. No. So, um, any questions on that? Any? So, is that uh, for your stool sample? Then it's like the solid collected sample mixed mm -hmm. with the solution itself, or water, or what? No. So basically, the client will bring in the sample, and then I'll take the sample, put it at the bottom of the cup, and then I'll add my solution okay. and stir it up. You talking about livestock? Oh, wait a second. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the same principle whether it's, you know, large animals, small animals. The idea is that... I just wondered what was in the jar, if there's anything else in the jar. Oh, so here? Yeah. These? Uh, is that water down at all, or is that just... This is pure feces, okay. with just a touch of water. Okay. Otherwise, it would start to evaporate, because we keep it in the refrigerator and store it. And uh, formality. Okay. Please you want your poop sample to be fairly fresh. Um, if it's going to be more than 24 hours, it doesn't need to be refrigerated because refrigerating is that slows the process, the process down. So generally, you want to run a few quick 
fecal sample within two to three hours of collecting your sample. Uh, I'm going to pass these out. Uh, please don't take them. Uh, these are just, uh, these are, you can see that some of the livestock, mainly cattle, and general parasite AIDS. Uh, you can get reference books all over the place on parasitology. And here's some tick guides and all that. We'll just cast these around, just cast them all around and take a look at them. Now, be friends with your veterinarian because I want to tell you that your vet can get stuff like this for you completely free. The drug companies would be more than happy to give it to your veterinarian, but they won't give it to you. Because you can't buy the drugs that they're selling. Yeah. Here's the top of the list. This is the top of the list. Set up for external parasites, and we got um, 
We got this is molecular loaders that's securing miles of cattle. This is oh yeah, this is the biggest, this is the largest louse in domestic animals. This is in hematopinosus, it's the pig louse, it's the sucking pig louse. And I can only show you the, an the uh, antenna on this guy. You can look this And this is flea. That's a flea. This is a Ripicephalus sanguinis, which is kind of a brown dog tick. And this is a mange mite. Uh, I left, we got five skulls with dual heads. And I'm not going to go through the, the, uh, a lesson with you. But you can come up here and look. So remember, when you look in here, move the eyepieces back and forth until you can just open your eyes up and see right in. So you have to go from eyepiece to eyepiece. That means the eyepieces are too far apart to close together. The second thing is all we got to do to focus this is use the outside of the knob. That's the fine focus. Because we have these pretty well focused in for you. They're all under low power because these are very big. Now, when we set up the little parasites in a little bit, uh, we're going to put on much higher magnification because you can't see the, the eggs under low power. So if you want to come up, there's only 12 of you, so 10 of you can go right off the bat and go through this. You can just start down there and work your way this way or this way. And uh, don't be afraid to ask this question.